Chapter 4 Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued I awoke in my own bed. If it's, the, if it's to be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before going to bed, and many such small details. But these things are no proof for there may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and from some cause or another. I am certain I must have been upset. I must watch for proof. For one thing I am glad. If it was not that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his tasks, for my pockets were intact. I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him if he were not have, if he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it, as I looked round the room, I, although it had been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, wanting to suck my blood. 18th May I have been down to look at that room again by, in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door frame was fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream, and must act on this surmise. 19th May I am surely in the toils. Last night the Count asked me to, in the suaviest tones, to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done, and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the first letter, and the third that I had left the castle and arrived in Bristorus. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present the state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count while I so absolutely are in his power, and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live, lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur with which may give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathered wrath from which manifested when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends, and that he assured me with so much impressiveness that he, that he would countermine the latter letters, which would be held over in Bristorus until due time in, in case chance would admit of my prolonged stay. That to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion. Therefore, I pretended to fall in with his views, and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated a minute, and then said, The first letter should be June 12th, the second June 19th, and the third June 29th. I know now that my, the span of my life. God help me. 28th May. There is a chance of escape or at any rate being able to send word home. A band of Stragani have come to the, the castle and are encamped at the courtyard. These Stragani are gypsies. I have notes on them on, in, I have notes of them in my book. They are of a particular part, um, they are peculiarly in this part of the world, although allied to the ordinary gypsies all over the world. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost all outside the law. They attach themselves as rule to some greater noble lord, Boriar, and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition, and they talk only in their own varieties of the Romani tongue. I shall write some letters home, and I shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken with them through my window to begin an acquaintanceship. They took off their hats and made uh, abstentiouses and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could speak their own language. I have written the letters. 
Mina's is in shorthand, and I simply asked Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her, I have explained my situation, but without the horrors by which only I may have surmised, it would shock and frighten her to death were I expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, the Count shall not yet know my secret and to the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. I threw them through the windows of my barred window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back into the study and began to read. As the Count did not come in, I have written here. The Count has come. He sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, This Trigani gave me these, of which I thought I know not whence they come. I shall, of course, take care. See, he must have looked at it. One is from you and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other... Here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the letter, and the, the dark look that came on his face and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed. Well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held the letter and envelope to the flame of a lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins, that I shall of course send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not come cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. When he was out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I, tried, I went over and tried the door, and the door was locked. When an hour or two came after, the Count came quietly into the room. His coming awoke into me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired? Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight, since there are many labors to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed, and strange to say, slept without dreaming, despite ha de des despair has its own calms. 31 May This morning when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag, and keep them in my pocket so that I may write in case I should get an opportunity. But then again, again a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to the, relating to the railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact all that might be useful to me once I was outside the castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some, something, some thought occurred to me. And I made search of my pertamont, and within the wardrobe is where I placed my clothes. The suit in which I traveled with it was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looked like some new scheme of villainy. 17th June This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgeling my brains, I heard what, without a cracking of whips or pounding or scraping of horses' feet on the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great ledger wagons, each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the head of each a pair of Slovaks with a wide, green, with a wide hat, great nailed studded belt, dirty sheepskin and high boots. They also had their long stab slaves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try to join them through the main hall, as though it was the way it might be open for them. Again to a shock, my door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed, but just then the hetman of the Strigani came out, and seeing them pointing to my window, said something at which they laughed. Henceforth, no effort of mine 
No piteous cry or anguished entreaty would make them ever look at me. They resultantly turned away. The letter wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. These were evidently empty by the ease in which the Slovaks handled them, and by their resonance when they were moved roughly. When they were all unloaded and packed into a great heap in one corner of the courtyard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Stagani, and spitting, and spitting on it for luck, lazily went back to each of their horses' heads. Shortly afterwards, I heard the cracking of their whips die away in the distance. 24th June, Before Morning Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up to the window winding stair and looked out the window, which opened south. I thought I would watch the Count, for there is something going on. Stegani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing some kind of work. I know it for, for now, and then I hear a far-off muffled sounds as if a matlock and splayed. And whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something come out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst traveling here and slung over his shoulder the, that, the terrible bag from which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too! This then is his new scheme of evil. That he would allow others to see me as they as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns and or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness, any that he which might he do, shall be by the local people attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and while I am shut here, a veritable prisoner, but without the protection of the law, which even is a criminal criminal's right in consultation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice there was some quaint little specks floating in the rays of moonlight. There, they were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled round and gathered in clusters in an oblonious sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure of more of a more comfortable position so I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up, a low, piteous howling of dogs somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to tame began to take shape into the sounds as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake to somehow call off my call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker the dust danced. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into a mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered until they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started broad awake and in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes, which had been gradually materializing from the moonbeams, were that of those three ghastly women to which I was doomed. I fled and felt somewhere safer, somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight and the lamp, where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed. And then there was a de silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me. With a beating of my heart, I tried the door, but I was still locked in my prison and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard without the agonizing cry of a woman I rushed to the window, and throwing it up, peered out behind the bars. There, indeed, was a woman with disheveled hair, holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against the corner of the gateway. When she saw my face, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice latent with menace, Monster! Give me back my child! 
She threw herself on her knees and raised her hands up, cried the same words in tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair and beat her breasts and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally, she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere overhead, probably in the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howlings of wolves. Before many minutes had passed, a pack of them poured, like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance of the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long, they streamed away, stinging, singingly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better off dead. What should I do? What can I do? How can I escape this dreadful thing of night and gloom and fear? 25th June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the morning grew so high this, the, this morning that it had stuck to the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot where it touched seemed to me as if the doe, the dove of the ark had lightened there. My, feel, my fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment from which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort while the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that final fatal series, which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. Action! It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have yet to see the Count in daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others awake? That he may be awake whilst they sleep? If only I could get into his room! But there is no possible way! The door is always locked! No way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body had gone, why may others another body go? I had seen him many times crawl from, my, from his window. Why should I not imitate him and go in by his window? The chances were desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, I can, it can only mean death, and a man's death is not a calf's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina. If I fail, goodbye, my faithful friend and second father. Goodbye, all and last of all, Mina. Same day later. I have made the effort, and God helping me, have come safely back to this room. I must put everything down in detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh, straight from the window to the south side, and once again got outside the narrow ledge of stone which runs around the building on this side. The stones were big and roughly cut, and the mortar had, by the process of time, been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out in the desperate way. I looked down once, as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful death would not overcome me. But after that I kept my eyes away from it. I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window, and made for it as well as I could, as I could, having regained the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy. I suppose I was too excited. But that, that the time seemed ridiculously short until I found myself standing on the window still and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation. However, when I bent down and slid my foremost feet through the window, then I looked around for the Count, but to my surprise and gladness, made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something of the, the, the same style as it had been in the south rooms and covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere else. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold and 
one corner. Gold of all kinds, Roman and British and Austrian and Hungarian and Greek and Turkish money covered with a film of dust as if it just lain long on the ground. None of that I noticed was less than 300 years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jeweled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried for, since I could not find the key to the room or the key to the outer door, which was the main objective of my search. I must make further examinations, or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open, and led to a stone passage in a circular stairway, which would, went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only lit by loopholes of heavy masonry. At the bottom was a dark tunnel-like passage, through it which came a deathly sickening odor, the odor of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. At last I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar and found myself in an old ruined chapel, which was evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places had, were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had been recently dug over, and the earth placed in a great wooden boxes, manifestly those that had been brought by the Slovaks. There was nobody about, and I made my search further outlet, but there was none. Then I went over every inch of the ground as to not lose a chance. I went down even in further into the vaults, where dim, the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread upon my soul. In these, into these two I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth, lay the Count. He was not either dead or asleep, I cannot say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death. And the cheeks had held the warm of warmth of life through all the pallor. The lips were as red as ever, but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could have lain he could not have lain there long for the earthy smell it would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, placed, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have had the keys on him, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead they were, with such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled the, pla the place, and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled up to the castle, up the castle walls. Regaining my room, I threw myself panting on the bed and tried to think. 29th June. Today is the date of my last letter, and the Count has taken steps to prove it was genuine. For again I saw him leave the castle by the same window, and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon so that I might destroy him. But I fear no weapon wrought alone by man's hands would have any effect on him. I dared not wait to see him return, for I feared to see those weird sisters. I came back to the library and read there until I fell asleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man can look, said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must depart. You return to your beautiful England, I through some work, which may have come to have, may have such an end as that we will never meet again. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the, Strag the Stragani, the Stragani, who have, have some labors of their own. Also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass to meet the diligences uh, from Bolkovina to Bitrus. And But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at... Castle Dracula. I suspected him and determined to test his sincerity. Sincerity! It seems like a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster. So I asked him point blank, Why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. 
But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled such a smooth and diabolical smile that I knew that there was some kind of trick behind his smoothness. He said, And your baggage. I do not care about it. I will send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said with a sweet courtesy made, which made me rub my eyes. It seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart, for it is the spirit by which rules our boyars. Welcome the company, speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will, though I am, though sad I am at your going, and that you so seriously desire it. Come. Stating with a stately gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was, also as it was almost as if the sound sprang from the rising of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seemed to leap from under the baton of the conductor. After a great pause, he proceeded in his stately way to the door drew back the, pie, the ponderous bolt, unlocked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked around, but could not see any key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without, of the wolves without grew louder and angrier, their red jaws with their champing teeth and their blunt clawed feet as they leapt come, came in through the opening door. I knew it that to struggle at that moment against the Count was useless. With such allies at his under his command, I could do nothing. But still, the door continued to slowly open, and only the Count's body stood in its gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment by means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation too. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea great enough for the count and at the last chance i cried out shut the door i shall wait until morning and covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment in one sweep of his powerful arm the count threw the door shut and the great bolts clanged and echoed in the halls as they shot back into place in the silence we returned to the library and after a minute or two i went back to my own room the last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me, with, his, uh, with a red light of triumph in his eyes and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. When I went back to my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back! Back to your own place! The time, your time has not yet come! Wait! Have patience tonight is mine. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a there was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I had appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. Is this it then? So near the end? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Lord, help me, and those two I am hold dear. 30th June. These may be the last words I will ever write in this diary. I slept until just before dawn, and when I woke, threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death had came, he should find me ready. At last I felt that subtle change in the air and knew that morning had come, and then the welcome cock crow, and I felt I was safe. With a glad heart I opened my door and ran about the hall. I had seen the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled in eagerness, I unlocked the chains and drew back the massive bolts, but the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door and shook it till, massive as it was, it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the count. 
Then a wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk, and I determined then and there to scale the wall again and gain the Comte's room. He might kill me, but death now seems the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed to the east window and scrambled down the wall, as before, into the Count's room. It was empty, but that was, I, that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner, and down the winding stair, and along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where that find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid lay on it, not fastened down, but with nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall. And then I saw something which filled my soul with very hot, with almost inscrutable horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and the moustache had turned to a dark iron gray. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst frozen flesh, for the lids and paunches underneath were bloated. It would seem as if the whole awful creature was simply gorged with blood. He lay there like a filthy leech exhausted with his rep repression. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense of the work and every sense of the in me revolted at the contact, and I had to search, or I was lost. The coming night seemed would see my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrible three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the Count. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being that I helped to transfer to London, where perhaps for centuries to come he might, amongst the teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever widening circle of semi-demons to batten at the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon in hand, but I seized a shovel for which the workmen had been using to fill the crates and lifted it high and struck with an edge held downward to that hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned and the eyes fell upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced in from the face, merely making a deep gouge, gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the frange of the blade caught down on the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from sight. The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice from which it had held its own in the night nethermost of hell. I thought and I thought of what my should next move would be, but my brain seemed on fire and I waited with a desperating feeling growing over me. As I waited, I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices coming closer, and though their song was rolling with heavy wheels and cracking of whips, the Stragani and the Slovaks, of whom the Count had spoken of, were coming. With a last look around me and at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained in the Count's room, but determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened. With strained ears, I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of the keys of the great lock and, fall, and the falling back of the heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for the one of the locked doors. Then came the sound of many feet tramping and dying away in some passage which sent it up a, chain, a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, which I might find the new entrance, but at the moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door of the winding stairway blew to with a shock that had sent dusts from the lentils flying. 
When I ran to push it open, I found that it was helplessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing around me more closely. As I write, there is a passage below the sound of the many trampling feet and the crashing of weights being set against, set down heavily, doubtlessly the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering. In the box, it is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy foot trampling again in the long hallway, with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut, and the chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdraw. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hawked in the courtyard down the rocky way of the, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips, and the chorus of Stragani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. Fah! Mina is a woman, and there is naught in common. They are devils in the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall further than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may find a way out of the, from this dreadful place, and then away from for home, away to the quickest and nearest train, away from this cursed spot, from this cursed land, where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than those of these monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At its foot a man may sleep, as a man. Goodbye, all. Mina.